a series called Power in Weakness, a, a, a paradox of sorts, a misnomer of sorts, because you don't normally think of power in weakness, you think of weakness in weakness. But God doesn't do hardly anything the way we do things down here on earth. And so God says that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your human weaknesses. It's a paradox of sorts that culminates in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 12 that God said to Paul. And this comes in chapter 12 after 12 chapters of Paul basically going through various things in his own life personally that illustrates power in weakness. Last week we started in chapter 1, of course, which is where we're going to be again today. And we started off with how God comforts us in all of our troubles. There is not one trouble in your life that God does not comfort you in. Just because you don't always feel it doesn't mean God ain't doing it. So we need to stop going by our feelings and we need to go more by the facts of our faith. And the facts of our faith says this, that God comforts us in all of our troubles, in all of our trials, and in all of our problems with pain. And how many people know that God's comfort can be very powerful in life? Amen? God's comfort is not passive. God's comfort is active. It's power in our lives. So that's where we started last week. We started last week at the beginning of chapter 1, which is always a good place to start. Start at the beginning of the book in chapter 1 that says, God's power in our human weakness comes in all of our times of trouble, in his peaceful presence and his power of comforting us through our times of, of problems with pain. Now, this week, what I want to focus on seems to, is going to seem to be kind of like you're just pulling over a little bit to the side, you know, and not sticking on the highway. It's going to feel that way at first. But what I want to share with you this morning is quintessential to living in God's power in spite of our human weaknesses. And it's simply called this. The title of this morning's message, if you're giving it a title, title it this, Having a Clear Conscience. Having a Clear Conscience. A person with a clear conscience lives in the power of God, in spite of their human weaknesses. Now, remember those miserable, troublemaking people that we talked about last week who would come into Corinth, and they were saying all bad things about Paul? They were trying to cause division between Paul and the Corinthians. They were saying things like, well, of course his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he's not impressive and his preaching amounts to nothing. Remember those miserable troublemaking people that we all have some of them in our lives? I'm not sure you can say God has blessed us with them, but Satan certainly has. Well, see, that's why we can relate to Paul in 2 Corinthians. Because we all have people in our lives that will call our character into question. We all have people in our lives that from time to time will horn their way into our relationships in our lives and, kind of, and try and cause problems. And, and within causing the problems, causing problems with pain in us. Now, many times, you've heard me say this before, many times we can deduce what's going on in, in that location, in that area, by what the writer writes in the Bible. You can kind of do deductive reasoning. So in other words, you look at what the uh, uh, writer wrote in response, and you can pretty much figure out the kind of things that were going on there. And, and that is very, very true with the book of 2 Corinthians. Because of Paul's responses in this letter, we can get a really good idea that his attackers were attacking his character in a three-pronged sort of way. Because there's three primary themes that Paul deals with, sub-themes that Paul deals with in 2 Corinthians, with the overriding theme, of course, culminating at God's power and our weakness. But Paul seems to be responding in, in 2 Corinthians to probably three primary things that his accusers were accusing him of. Number one, the first thing, is that they were probably saying things like, well, you know, his times of trouble and problems with pain are really probably because of hidden sin, of secret sin. There must be sin in his life because that's why he's gone through all of these problems and all these trials and trouble and problems with pain and persecuting, persecutions and whippings and beatings because really, if God was blessing him, he wouldn't have any problems with pain. How many people have ever heard a Christian say something that foolish before? 
and, 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 and of course you have, and so have I. Right? Well, Paul must be going through his problems with pain because there's hidden sin in his life. A secret sin. Or maybe the second accusation was more like, well, really, Paul's just manipulating you and using you, Corinthians, for his own hidden agendas and ulterior motives. I mean, on the outside, sure, he seems to be all about you, but Paul's really all about himself, isn't he? How many people have ever heard that? Now raise your hands. Or maybe the third one is comes, and it comes really into focus between chapters 10, 11, and 12, but the third one is really, well, you know, Paul is teaching false doctrine. He is, you know. He really doesn't have the kind of relationship with God that he says he has. You know, he, he's a nominal Christian, or maybe he's no Christian at all. But, but you really need to follow us and not Paul. All of a sudden you, you see the not-so-subtle ulterior motives coming out there in them. Because Paul really doesn't have a relationship with God, and, and he's teaching you false doctrine. Again, don't raise your hands, but how many people have ever heard that in church? Not to mention the world, right? So, while you can't stop, and you can't stop them, so don't even try, while you can't stop people from questioning your character, and calling your character into question, and trying to assassinate your character every now and then, you, well, you can't stop it, and you can't, so don't even try. You don't have to put up with it. You don't have to tolerate it. You don't have to lay down and take it. You can do like Paul did, and you can stand up and you can clarify yourself. You can clarify yourself by reiterating the clarity of your conscience. In other words, my conscience is clear. You see, what Paul is doing throughout the book of 2 Corinthians is he's basically telling us over and over again, at least, actually I should say in what we're going to cover this morning, he's saying, my conscience is clear. Say what you want. Say what you may. But I can tell you for sure, my conscience is clear. I have no hidden agendas, no ulterior motives. My yes is yes, my no is no. And in fact, our message from, from me to Silas to Timothy has not been yes and no, but it's always been yes and yes and amen in Christ. It's been consistent and, and clear. So you can say what you want. My conscience is clear. Now because psychologists and counselors <coughs> don't really want to deal with conscience anymore, they, they don't want to deal with conscience, talk about conscience, confront the conscience. They would just rather ignore the conscience. And they would rather say things like, well, we don't have to talk about conscience because, after all, what, we're all products of our environment around us. All of the external environments around us are really what build us and make us in life. And while there is, there is partial truth to that, I myself know that I am not a hollowed out reed, that I'm just surrounded by ex external things and stimuli and environment that helps you to kind of start me off in life, but I also have an inside. I also have a conscience on the inside. So I am made up of, and so are you, of just not our external things, but also what's on the inside as well. And because clinical psychologists and, and, and counselors don't want to deal with conscience anymore, can we just park here for a minute and talk about the human conscience again? Because nobody seems to be talking about it anymore. And, I think it gives life relevance, and it certainly shows up a lot in Paul's writings. The human conscience, remember that old thing, that little bugaboo thing that's on the inside here, that was created by God and put into you because it was put into Adam and Eve to begin with? It's that little voice inside of us that helps us to understand the difference between what's right and what's wrong, and, and it shows up first in the first two human beings, Adam and Eve, back in Genesis chapter 3. Remember where, where, they, where they decided what they were going to do? It was their conscience that gave them that choice. You see, our conscience is, makes us incredibly, uniquely different than the animals around us. Because we have a conscience. We get to choose what we want to do. Go to the left or go to the right. Do right or do wrong. Animals don't enjoy such choice. Now, I know there's some animal rights activists and some other people, and, and, and they, they will say, well, look, animals have a conscience, too. I have never seen an animal's conscience. Frankly, I've never seen my conscience. <laughs> but watching animals, they seem to be more instinctive than they are driven by a conscience. Be it wild or domesticated, 
It seems to be an instinct. Now, of course, animals can learn by Pavlov's dog uh, theory of what to do or not do, depending upon the risk and the reward that might come with whatever they're doing. But even that is still an instinctive trait. Human beings enjoy a conscience which gives us choice, which lets us decide what we want to do, if it's right or if it's wrong. And remember in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they used that conscience of choice, and they decided to sin against God and eat from the tree. And then what was the second choice that they made shortly after that, right out of that same conscience again? All of a sudden they realized, oh, we did wrong. We chose poorly. So what was the second thing that their conscience chose for them to do but to hide from God? Like most people who realize they've sinned against God do. Most people who realize they've sinned against God, all of a sudden they try and find the biggest bush that they can find and they try and bury their head under that bush so they think God can't see them. They go to the movies, they go for a drive in a car, they go to a bar. They go anywhere they think God is not this side of hell because they don't want God to see them. Why? Because their conscience told them. Boy, did you mess up. Boy, did you make a mistake. Boy, did you chose the wrong thing to do. Instead of choosing the right thing to do. Our conscience, church, is intricately important when it comes to working with God. Our conscience is hugely important when it comes to God's power making up for our human weaknesses. Now, we secondly see, in, in as far as the conscience goes, in John chapter 8, that it was the conscience of the people and the Pharisees that realized they were doing the wrong thing by wanting to stone that woman that caused them to put the rocks down. They chose the right thing, John 8, 9 says, because of conviction in their conscience. You get that in the New King James Version. Every now and then I love to go back and embrace the King James Version because certain things come out more clearly in the King James Version than they did the NIV. Other times the NIV is more clear, and sometimes New uh, American Standard Bible has got the really best translation, and the New Living Translation and Revised English Version, I mean, they're, they're all good. It just depends what you're kind of looking for within that doctrine, within that, that scenario that's going on. And King James tells us that in John chapter 8, the people put down their rocks because they were convicted in their conscience that they were doing the, about to do the wrong thing. Paul said in Romans chapter 2 and in Romans 9 that, that even an, un, uh, an unregenerated conscience can bear witness to spiritual truths and a conscience is what detects what is of the Holy Spirit of God. In John 16, 8, it talks about how the Holy Spirit convicts the world uh, between things of sin and righteousness. And we're told that even an unregenerated conscience can feel that. They can feel that they're doing wrong. Now, they might not want to do anything about it. They might not want to repent. But they still know that there is a what? Moral standard or a super moral standard, a spiritual standard that they are, are not living up to. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul told Timothy that over time, people can actually sear, sear their conscience or burn their conscience to the point that they can't feel the pain of their own guilt anymore, which is unfortunate because then they fail to realize their need for God's grace and God's forgiveness in their life. Now, don't get me wrong, this doesn't make them any less responsible for their bad attitudes and bad actions and their bad choices that they made in their conscience, but what it means is a human being can get to the point where they have burned their conscience so long over a period of their lifetime that they don't even feel the conviction of guilt in their lives anymore. Has anybody ever burned your hand, maybe, or part of your body so badly that the nerve endings died in that part of your hand and you don't actually feel pain there anymore? I know somebody like that. They, they burned this part of their hand once so badly. Their nerve endings have all died in their pinky and in, in this side of, of their hand. They don't feel pain anymore over there. That's the closest that I get to picturing what searing a conscience is like, burning a conscience is like. You don't feel the pain of guilt anymore, and you don't therefore realize the need for God and the availability of God's grace and of God's forgiveness. And it says in, in um, 1 Peter chapter 3, 16, that having a clear conscience has everything to do with being a Christian in life. 
Being a Christian comes with things of being open and honest and sincere. The yes is yes, the thing you know is no. You don't have these agendas if you're a Christian. You don't have ulterior motives if you're a Christian. You have a clear and an open conscience before God and before people. It's part of clear conscience is part of being a Christian. And frankly, that's what Paul said throughout uh, the New Testament whenever he talked about himself and his conscience. He talked actually a lot about his con conscience. In the book of Acts, he says that I have lived my life before God with a good and clear conscience. And he said, I always take pains to have a clear conscience before God and man. He always, he never wanted to have any secret hidden agendas or ulterior motives. He never wanted to have that secret sin or that secret whatever going on inside of his conscience. He always just wanted to live. He said he took pains to live honestly and openly with God and with people around him. His yes was yes, his no was no. Later in Timothy, he said it's our aim as Christians to love people that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And then he also said to fight the good fight with a clear conscience. But God doesn't expect us to be perfect. See, we need to, we need to stop that. We need to stop thinking God expects us to be perfect. He doesn't. We live in a process of perfection, and the only thing that we are told is perfected in our weaknesses is God's power which comes from his grace, which comes as a result of our humbleness, which comes from what? Simply having a clear conscience. See, God's not expecting perfection out of us. He's just expecting us to have a clear conscience. And I can absolutely tell you that's what Paul had. He went through the entire New Testament talking about my conscience is clear. I'm not a perfect person. Paul was here right now, and he would tell you he's not a perfect person. But he would say, I strive to live my life before and after Christianity, and when he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he was striving to live with a clear conscience. That's all God expects of you. That's all God expects of me, and I think that's a reasonable expectation. To have a clear conscience. Because when you have a clear conscience, even though you're not a perfect person and you're full of weaknesses, as I am, God's power and grace can manifest and motivate and work in and through our human weaknesses, compensating for our human weaknesses in spite of our human weaknesses. We can live the way Paul lived. Paul lived a very powerful life. But we have to understand the foundation of Paul's life was he had a clear conscience as a Christian. Having a clear conscience is part of being a Christian. You can live this next week of your life this way, too. You can live in the power of God's grace in spite of your weaknesses. This next week of your life can be victorious. Amen. Just keep your conscience clear. Don't worry about people calling your character into question. They'll do it anyway. But like Paul, just be able to say, I strive to live my life with a clear conscience. Because that's humbleness that gets you God's grace. God's grace is God's power to empower you in spite of you.